Hello and welcome to our jam session today. Um, today we are talking about IPv6 and how it impacts communication applications. I would like to introduce Dan York, Director of Conversations at Voxeo, who is your presenter today. So Dan, welcome. Thank you very much, Sabina, and thank you all for joining us today. Uh, my name, as Sabina said, is Dan York, and I um, want to talk today about IPv6 in general and about how it impacts communications applications in particular. And I've got a lot that I'll be covering in this space. Uh, just a couple of logistical notes before we get going. One is that um, I would encourage you to go and um, ask questions through the GoToWebinar interface. And, and you're going to see that over on the right side of your screen. There's an area where you can ask questions. And uh, we would be delighted if you'd uh, ask some there. We'll have a period at the end where we can go and do that. If you are on Twitter and tweeting anything out out of this uh, session, there's some great hashtags like IPv6 or, and or Voxeo that we'd love to have you on there. And if, you're, um, if you have to leave or anything there, or if you have colleagues who you think would like to hear this, the archive will be available for this at blogs.voxeo.com slash jam sessions. So with that, I want to get started and talk a little bit about uh, where we're going and what's happening here. So first of all, I mean, why IPv6? Let's just set the stage a little bit about that. You know, we've had since the beginnings of the internet back in the 80s and, and so on, we've had these IPv4 addresses, 192, 168.20.12, whatever it may be, some combination thereof. And that's the addresses we've gotten used to, four blocks of decimal numbers, four octets, as we sometimes say, et cetera. But that's what we've gotten used to. The challenge that we have today that's going on is that there's a ton of people looking to connect devices to the internet. I, you know, mobility. I show here some phones happening. This is a picture taken from Budapest, and these aren't necessarily smartphones, but they're devices that are out there. The mobile network's growing. Uh, it, you know, it's just a recent report that there are now 846 million uh, subscribers, mobile subscribers in India alone. You know, you look at the kind of range of, of the volume of people using putting more devices onto the network and more mobile devices, more smartphones, more items like this. Part of the challenge is, of course, that much of the world was left out of the original IPv4 allocation game. If you were in North America or Europe, your chance of getting a, a large number of IP addresses was very good. You could get a very large uh, block. You know, here you want a, a class A address with a whole zillion addresses, you can get that. But much of the rest of the world, especially in Asia and other areas, just didn't get the level of IPv4 allocations that we had. And so as you get you know, a billion people in China and, and similar numbers in, in India who are coming online, getting more mobile, getting, using more devices, looking to connect things, the providers there are saying, you know, we need more addresses to connect all of our devices together. And so that's part of what's, what we're seeing happening in here. Another item, of course, is that each of us are very often getting more and more devices. I mean, I know myself. I carry an iPhone. I have an iPad. I have other devices around. I'm looking to have more devices with me, more pieces. I want to go and connect things. Everybody is getting more and more devices, connecting them again to the mobile networks in particular and to the larger internet. So we're seeing this need for more address space. There's also this whole concept of the internet of things. And I love this drawing. It was somebody's uh, mind map for a talk that they were giving. But it's this whole concept that we hook up everything out basically on the internet. And if you look at what some people are talking about with machine to machine interaction, M to M, Internet of Things is another term that people are using, but they want to wire up you know, every aspect of your car uh, to make it uh, accessible to the internet, or wire up your house, so your refrigerator and your stove. And I've seen things where there's actually you know, IP addresses associated with, every, with a sensor in every plug, so you can be able to go and monitor uh, information that's, that's there. So I mean, you've got a, you know, can have a zillion addresses, IP addresses, in your own house. And so each of those devices you know, needs to have address space. So where do we get all the address space that we can, we can need to give every little thing an IP address? In the defense world, uh, the, the Department of Defense here in the United States, and in their space, they look at this a lot with uh, the warfighter, with the soldier, with being able to, to have IP addresses all over for all the devices that a soldier may carry, et cetera, and pieces like that. So there's a lot of people looking at how do you connect all this other stuff? So I mean, we're really moving to a space that you could, we could call everything over IP. And that's an important part of, what we're, of what's uh, driving the interest in IPv6. Now, you know, we've prolonged IPv4 an awfully long time. We've had network address translation, NAT. 
which has allowed us to take an entire network and put it behind a, a single public IP address. And most all of us who are in our homes or in a business, we're running that to be able to go and and uh, and have the uh, all of our private devices, however many we have, connected up uh, behind there. And you could take like the 10.0 block of addresses that are allocated as private IPs, in and you can go and set that up and have you know all of those many 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 thousands of devices behind there. And in fact, that's what some folks are looking at doing um, in what's called carrier grade NAT or large scale NAT, which is the idea that you could take an entire you know, an ISP could take all of their subscribers, basically, and put them behind a single IP address. And, and there are, this is probably one of the techniques that some folks will use to go and uh, continue to prolong the availability of IPv4 addresses. Now, and we should talk about that for a minute. We had a recent event, February 1st, where we, uh, we ran out of top-level IPv4 addresses. And the thing is that if you look at how IP addresses are allocated, the Internet Assigned Numbers Authority at the top level, IANA, they allocate out IP addresses, blocks of IP addresses, to regional Internet registries, RIRs, and there are five of them. The one for North America is called ARIN. There's also RIPE over in Europe. There's AFNIC, and I'm missing the other one, but whatever. There's five of them that, that have the mid-layer of the IP addresses. They then allocate IP address blocks out to Internet service providers, and there's a tiered structure there. There may be you know, upper-level ones who get the first blocks from the regional registry and then they allocate the other uh, registrars and on and on down to where you actually get IP addresses for your home or your business. So you know that's how that process works. So some folks are certainly going to turn to solutions like carrier grade NAT or, uh, or also called long um, LSN for this type of thing. Now the problem of course for us in the real-time communication space is, uh, is this, right? SIP doesn't really like NAT has a real problem with it, in fact, and we've come up with a whole range of solutions for how to deal with that and how to make that work in, in various different ways. So I think we're going to see a lot of, uh, you know, that's going to be a problem there. Now, if you're expecting me to say that IPv6 will just mystically solve this and get rid of all the NAT problems, I'm not. Because, yes, that's one of the promises that it can offer, but the reality is that NAT's still going to be with us for a variety of reasons, and if you want me to get into that discussion, feel free to raise that as a question, and we can take it up there. But anyway, that's um, that's a bit of what's kind of driving this. So February 1st of this year, to go back to my original question, IANA allocated its last block of IP addresses that it had out to the regional registries, and the regional registries are then in their plans to go and allocate those addresses out to other folks that are there. Uh, you may have um, you may have recently heard Microsoft purchase a large block of uh, IP addresses from Nortel, IPv4 addresses, a block that was there, and that was just approved yesterday for something netting out at around $11 an uh, IPv4 address. I expect we'll see more of that as people try to look at how long can we stay on IPv4. So the solution, obviously, one solution is to look at what do we do to move to IPv6. So I want to spend a couple minutes talking about the basics of what IPv6 is about. And if you're very familiar with IPv6, hang on, we're going to get into the IPv6 and that side, but I want to make sure people have a a level set of sort of where we are with IPv6. So, you know, IPv4, standard address block, four octets, four blocks of numbers, decimal notation, very easy for us to understand, you know, 10.1.5.53, whatever it may be. And it's always the four blocks separated by dots. IPv6 looks a lot different. And it's, uh, it's both longer, uglier, it's, uh, it's hexadecimal. Well, I suppose it's not ugly if you like hex. But hey, it's, it's just a big, long string of, of letters, numbers, all of this separated by colons. The other interesting characteristic of IPv6, which is different from IPv4, is that you don't always have eight blocks of, of, uh, of numbers. In fact, you can have a much smaller address. IPv4 addresses, or IPv6 addresses, can actually, in some cases, be smaller than IPv4. We'll see that in a moment. But what you see here on the screen is I've got an address that has a bunch of zeros in it. So what I can do is wherever I have a bunch of zeros, I can put in a double colon. So that first line and the second line are equivalent, but that double colon uh, makes, it, uh, makes it work that way, look that way. So that's a way you can compress addresses. And that's interesting when you look at in IPv4, we have the loopback address, 127.0.0.1. In IPv6, that's a colon, colon, one. So a much shorter address that you see in that kind of space. So it's, there's some different 
things that happen in IPv6 addresses that are different from the very determined way that IPv4 works. There's also a question on port numbers, and this comes in especially when we talk about real-time communications and the way we use port numbers and all of that. If you look at the top address, 192.168.2012 colon 5060, most of the folks listening to that would probably realize that that's you know, the SIP address, 5060, the SIP, the, the SIP port on this IP address. And in IPv4 land, that makes a whole lot of sense. But what does that mean in IPv6? If you look at that address on the bottom, that is a perfectly valid IPv6 address. You know, complete with that, that colon 5060 is just a, another, another one of those blocks. The double colon just means some of the stuff was collapsed in the middle. But the problem you have in IPv6 is you can't just attach a port number with a colon as you could in IPv4. The solution, the way around that, is to use square brackets around the IPv6 address, which is the way that it works. And, and I'll show you here on, on this slide here, these are real IP addresses, I mean, real URLs. And I can go here and say HTTP colon um, this in square brackets slash index or colon port number. Notice the SIP addresses. I've got, again, SIP colon Dan at, and then I've got the square brackets around the IPv6 address. This is a way to do it. Now, for you using it in the SIP space, you know, if you're, if you're actually entering in IP addresses, IPv6 addresses, which I hope you're not. I hope we're using DNS. But if you have to, this is the notation that you'll use to go and do that and provide a IPv6 address, um, which can then have an, a port number extended to it. Now, let's take a look at uh, subnet masks or another component of this. In the IPv4 space, we are used to saying, you know, here's my address. It is 192.168.20.0. It's my network address with the subnet mask of 255.255.255.0. And those of us who dealt with network engineering and that type of stuff got really used to saying 255.255.255.0 or whatever it might be. Now, for a while, we've had a concept in IPv4 called CIDR, classless interdomain routing, and it's this concept of using a slash for the number of bits that you're talking about with regard to subnet mask. So these two items here are equivalent, the first two lines the subnet mask of 255.255.255.0 and 192.168.20.0 slash 24. It says the first eight bits are the network portion of the address, and the remaining eight bits, in this case, are the host portion. Well, as you can imagine, doing a bunch of 255.255.255 in IPv6 would be insane. So IPv6 uses only this notation. So you have the space where you get into an IPv6 address, and then you have slash and some number of bits that are significant. Now, most IPv6 addresses are allocated on a slash 64 basis. Now, if you recall or if you think about it, IPv4 is 32 bits, all right? It's four blocks of eight bits, 32 bits. Um, IPv6 is 128 bits. And addresses, though, are being given out in terms of um, a slash 64 which means there, half the address space is for the network portion and half is for the host. And you might say, well, doesn't that mean we're, autom we're already throwing away half the address space? I mean, why would I get a, a, a slash 64, you know, 164 bits worth of address space for my home or something? And, and we'll see why in a moment. But that's the way it's being allocated. And, and that's the way you're notating this. You can see another one, FE80 colon, colon slash 10. The, 10. the first 10 bits are significant. The remainder is the host portion. So this is the subnet mask is different in IPv6 space. Another fundamental difference is the fact that in IPv6 we will have, we will have multiple IPv6 addresses per interface. In IPv4 land, we only have one IP address, on one IPv4 address per interface. So if you have two internet cards, um, if you have two, if you have two uh, NICs network interface cards, each one of those will have a, a separate IPv4 address, and that's it. Um, but in IPv6 land, you're going to have at least two. You're going to have a link local address and, and then a global address if you have a, a global IV, IPv6 address. So it's multiple addresses, which gets into when you're talking about you know, applications, how do they know which address to bind to? And there's some pieces we'll talk about with that. But it's a different concept in IPv6 land. So auto configuration is a big part of, uh, of what's going on here in IPv6 space. And you can see here on the screen, I've got these two IPv6 addresses up at the top. And if you look at the bottom, I put my, the Ethernet address. Now, this is not a real one. It's just a demo here. But you get the idea. 
So you can take the MAC address, the Ethernet address of your system, and you can fold that into the address to create, a, um, to create an IPv6 address. And what this does is it makes it so that you don't have to use DHCP to assign addresses. You don't have to do this. And also, a device will come onto a network, will join a new network, and can just auto-configure itself to be on there and to, to have this address and be able to work with it. I put a note on there. If you have security reasons why you don't want the MAC address of your devices to be put into the, the IPv6 addresses it has, there is a way to go and, and to use privacy extensions so you're not just doing this automatically. But this is the idea is that you can do auto configuration. There's also a concept called neighbor discovery. And there's a particular element around this called router advertisements, which is that a router will essentially send out on the local network the fact that it has, um, you know, that it's there, that it can route IPv6, and what its network address is, the network portion of the address. And so what happens is you wind up building your IPv6 address from the combination of the router advertisement that gives you the first part, the network portion of the, of the, host, of the uh, host address, and then you auto-configure the second part based on your Ethernet address. So it's actually, in so many ways, a really brilliant way to go and make this work because you're getting your auto config, your, your host portion is coming from your, your device, which should have a unique Ethernet address. And your network portion is coming from the router that is on the, the link you're connected to. So if you move your device to another network, another subnet, and you're, you're there, and you connect on there, you should get a router advertisement, which will tell you where you should be routing there. And so you'll build your IPv6 address work to be able to go and, and work that way. So it's, it's actually a really pretty smart way to go and make this work. You can think of people who have mobile devices and they're moving from one network to another or something like that. The ability to go and do this. And, and actually there's a, a separate mobility part of IPv6 which lets you keep an address as you go across this. Because again, remember that you can have multiple IPv6 addresses per interface. It's an it's a interesting part of that. It's part of things. Now another part of is, is IPv6 is DNS. And this comes into play when you start talking about SIP servers and pieces like that. Um, in IPv4, we use an A record in DNS. And that specifies what our IPv4 address is for a given domain. Now in IPv6, we use a quad A, four A's. And that specifies it. Same idea. It's just, uh, it's just that you're using a quad A versus a, a regular A record. Now, are some other uh, differences that we look into um, in IPv6. Uh, ICMP plays a very strong role in, in using this, in working with IPv6 between devices. So, you know, little things like if you wind up blocking your IPv or ICMP at your firewall, bad things will probably happen there. Um, also, in, in uh, IPv4, uh, you typically would wind up fragmenting packets to be able to send them along to make sure they fit in the maximum transmission unit of, of, the, of the Ethernet segments that are going along. That doesn't happen in IPv6. Instead, what happens is there's a, there's a, a, a path MTU that, that determined. Basically, what's the smallest size of the actual frames that can go across this? And so the packets are not fragmented. There's not broadcast anymore like we have in traditional IPv4. Instead, there's a lot of multicast usage. And there is NAT traversal. And it is a little different, but similar in, in terms of how it works. Uh, to get started, I, I'll put up a link here, which I'm going to come back to a couple times, but it's just bit.ly slash voxeo IPv6 will take you to an IPv6 resource page that I've put together. And a couple of things on there, if you have a home office, like I'm talking to you out of right now, or a place like that, and you want to get set up with IPv6 to try out some of those things, there's a service offered by Hurricane Electric, which is one of the ISPs out there that's been doing a lot with IPv6, called tunnelbroker.net which lets you go and, and very easily create a tunnel from your home network out to the, uh, to the public IPv6 network. And so you can try it out and work with it. I've got a couple of blog posts that walk you through the process that's there and explain what's going on and how you can do it. I've also got some uh, tutorials around IPv6 and some other materials around that there. So please uh, you know, feel free to take a look at what's there. Um, now, I'm going to go on and talk a bit about SIP and IPv6. I'll remind you again, and for folks who have just joined us, please do ask questions through the uh, GoToWebinar interface. And uh, if uh, I see a couple questions, um, if I talk for 20 minutes about the basics of IPv6 and you don't have questions, I would be very surprised. So please do feel free to uh, open up that GoToWebinar interface and ask some questions 
we will be talking about that uh, at the end of the session. Again, if you're just joining us, the uh, archive will be available at the end as well. And if you are tweeting out, we'd love it if you tweet out with uh, hash sign IPv6. So let's talk about SIP and how this works. Now, the good news is that IPv6 and SIP can work perfectly fine together. Here's a shot of me using uh, a soft phone called LinPhone. And being the security, security paranoid guy that I am, I did block out some of the IP uh, v6 addresses in there. But you know, it's the idea here. Uh, so far, LinPhone is the only open source free soft phone that I've yet found that, uh, that really works well with IPv6. Um, if you know of others, I'd love to hear them uh, because I'm trying out a number of these different things and I'd love to list that, et cetera. But LinPhone basically goes, uh, works with you. You can just enter in the, the address directly and it will go and, and make the connection work with that. So it's open source free. It's available on Linux, Windows, and Mac OS X, which I did not know because I used to know it as LinPhone only on Linux, but it turns out to work across all of the platforms that are there. All you have to do is go into the preferences, change it to say use IPv6 instead of IPv4, and it will just start working. You might also need to change it down where it says NAT and firewall. If I use LinPhone on my home network uh, using IPv4, I have to say that I'm behind a network and a NAT firewall because I am. But if I'm using IPv6, I am directly connected to the internet because I'm using the tunnel broker service that get, puts me on live on the public IPv6 network, which is something to think about from a security point of view is do you have a firewall at the edge of your network that can make sure that you're not necessarily letting people come in because you, all of the devices in your home may have live, real public IPv6 addresses if they support IPv6. Something to think about there. The other big thing with, uh, with SIP is that you know, DNS is certainly your friend. You don't want to be typing in these, uh, the IPv6 addresses in any kind of large scale. So you really want to look at how you can use IPv6 to leverage uh, the pieces that are there. Now, when we start talking about SIP, it's important to realize that when we're doing SIP, okay, when we're working with it, we're talking about two different paths. We have the SIP path, the call control path, which is going between our good friends Alice and Bob and going through an IPPBX or some kind of, of SIP server, whatever it may be. And then you have the media path, which could be streaming directly from Alice and Bob. They may be talking directly to each other. It may also go through media gateways, proxies, SPCs, everything else. But that's the basic kind of architecture we look at. And a typical call flow that we see is we see an invite going from Alice to Bob, ringing, going back, a 200 OK, Axe, buys, all. And in, in the middle of that, we're seeing that bi-directional media it's streaming between the endpoints. And it's important to think about this because it does have ramifications for how SIP works. And, I'll, and one particular caveat when we get into mixed v4 and v6 environments, and we'll see that coming up. You know, the architecture more often is something that looks like this, where you have Alice talking to her SIP proxy, which then finds Bob's SIP proxy, talks to it, and then talks to Bob's user agent, and then again, the media might stream between them, or it might look a lot more like this, where you have multiple SIP proxies going across some wider area network and then connecting back through a series of media proxies, which might be session border controllers or other devices that are going and, and doing this. So you're seeing a lot of this. This is the reality of the, of the complexity we're dealing with. So, so again, you've got SIP, control channel, headers being passed. You've got this offer answer model which is important, which is what happens when, you know, when I'm sending you a SIP invite, I'm passing along to you um, messages that are in this parameters or in this SDP, session description protocol, say, here I am, here's the IP address I'm at, here's the codecs I can support, here's the kind of media stream I want, I can do this type of thing, what channels can I do? And then the response coming back from the user agent on the other end is that is their list of what they can support. And so through that process, the endpoints negotiate what codec they're going to use over what media stream, what channel, all those different types of things. So that's all there. But you have to remember, you've got SIP and you've got SDP. They're two different protocols with different issues that come in there. Another piece is that SIP has a variety of headers that are in there. Some of those are standard. Others of those may be custom headers that are, that are being uh, defined in it along there. So when you look at SIP clients and servers, we really have to think in terms of IPv4 only, which is what we've been dealing with to date, and then also um, IPv6 only, which if we were all IPv6, it would be pretty straightforward and easy. And then you have um, dual stack, IPv4 and IPv6. And that's what, for the foreseeable future, I expect that we will see most devices are dual stack uh, software and even hardware, where we're going to be seeing 
you know, they support both IPv4 and IPv6 and a range of issues that come around there. Now, interestingly, just last week, on the 28th of April, there's a brand new RFC released, RFC 6157, which is all about the uh, transition from IPv4 to IPv6 for SIP. So it goes through some of the issues I've talked about here, has some other different things, and gets into a bit more detail in a couple points. But it's a good one to go and take a look at. So RFC 6157, I'll come back to that a little bit later with a little link as well. So one of the issues you need to think about in, in terms of SIP is, is how will user agents, how will endpoints, clients, how will they find their SIP servers and SIP proxies? Now, one point is that DHCP, I told you before, wasn't needed for address assignment. And that's very true because a device can assign itself an IPv6 address based on the router advertisement that gets at the network part and the auto configuration, which can get at the host part. So it can create its own IPv6 address, and that works perfectly fine. But the challenge is that if you think of how DHCP is used in an IPv4 environment, it gives out the IPv4 address, but it also gives out a bunch of other stuff, DNS servers, uh, you know, other different mail servers, other different devices, different things that may be part of your, your infrastructure. So you have to have some way to learn that. Now, one way is that you can implement DHCP v6, and there is such a thing. And there are options for SIP servers that are defined in RFC 3319. So your, your IPv6 user agent can learn from DHCP v6. It can go and get that information about what it are the local DNS servers or the local SIP servers, I should say, in this particular case. And so it can work with that. It, the client can also use uh, DNS itself, assuming it has somehow been uh, configured with uh, DNS, whether it's through DHCP or whether it's through manual config, whatever it may be, um, you can use that because you are, you know, per RFC 3263, there's a mechanism where through NAPTA records and server SRV records, you can find out what the DNS servers are, you know, both for you and for the other endpoint, et cetera. You can work with that. So one process of finding out the SIP servers and proxies you need to talk to is to use uh, DNS that way as well. So something to think think about. The other piece to think about is, um, uh, you know, the the fact that you publish a quad A record doesn't necessarily I, it doesn't necessarily mean it all work, right? Because you get a, a question if you have both IPv4 and IPv6. If you have a software client, you have a soft client that knows how to support IPv6. Okay, you go out and you do a DNS query and you go and you get A records and quad A records. All right. Now, here's the thing. You can get quad A records perfectly fine over IPv4. I can be on an IPv4 system, and if you're on IPv4 right now and you're used to using something like DIG, uh, you can just do DIG, you know, quad A and some name that, that has a quad A record, and you could pull that down over IPv4. So you can get the DNS record, but it doesn't mean you can necessarily connect out there. You know, I could get a, a quad A record that says, here's the IPv6 address of my SIP server, but what if your client doesn't have real IPv6 connectivity. It might have a link local address because IPv6 has been enabled on the system, but it doesn't have a real IPv6 address to get it out there. So it may try there. And one of the questions, one of the challenges is, is um, how do you resolve the timeout issue? How long do you try it on IPv6 before you try IPv4? You know, because that's typically the process people do in many of the softwares. They go and they first try on IPv6 to, to make a connection, and then when that doesn't uh, work, it will fail over to IPv4 and, uh, and connect to the A address of the, the A record there. Well, that's great, but, but what's the timeout? When we're in re real-time communications, there's that real-time aspect. We don't want to wait X number of, of you know, microseconds or seconds for the timeout to occur. Uh, there's a draft out there written by Dan Wang and some others called uh, Happy Eyeballs, and if you Google on that, well, probably Happy Eyeballs IETF, you'll see that uh, there's a draft, and the idea is around, well, when you do the DNS query, query for both the quad A records and the A records, and then send out an inquiry to both and see which responds back faster, and then take the fastest one. You know, simplistic way to go and do it, and, and just see, do I get there faster on IPv6 or IPv4? Whichever one is faster, that's the one I'll use, and the connection I'll use. But that's a draft out there that you can go and look at it. There is a defined process around which address to use, RFC 3484, and you know, most operating systems do the right thing in this case, and, and they, may, they, may, may, they may make the choice for you and or limit your choice is what you can do. But those are things you have to be thinking about in terms of this. Now, 
other pieces, if you're communicating from an IPv4 client and an IPv6 client going through a proxy server, for instance, you can wind up with, um, you know, how, if you have a proxy that's dual stack, that can speak both IPv6 and IPv4, you know, it can and should be able to go and do the, the, uh, the communication between them so that it knows how to go and, uh, and co communicate. One of the things it uses is what's called a record route uh, header in the SIP packet, which will go and send, excuse me, it'll, it'll record the route that it took. And so if it will do this so that it can then unroll those routes to be able to go back and figure out how to get back to that point. So the proxies need to use record route to indicate where they are and which address um, they're using. But it, but it can work. I mean, this is a way that it will work so that you can have an IPv4 client and an IPv6 client talking through a dual stack proxy. So it can work in that regard. You also can have, again, mixed communication across the path of proxies. If you go back to that picture that showed the complexity of where it's going, you know, so that type of thing can happen in there. Um, also, you might have mixed communication. You might wind up using IPv6 for SIP, for instance, and then you wind up using IPv4 for, uh, for the media stream, for the media server. You might get in cases like this. So these are things you have to be thinking about in regard to that. Another piece is that, you know, that SDP packet that I talked about that involves the, the media capability, Right now, a challenge that we certainly have is that, is that uh, IP, or the SDP only allows a single IP address for each media stream. It's the, the C parameter inside the SDP packet, for those who know it. And so you can put an IPv4 address, or you can put an IPv6 address, but you can't put in both. It's one or the other. If you had two sections of your SDP, one that said IPv4 and one that said IPv6, you would actually wind up with your, you would say that you want to establish two separate media streams. So raw vanilla SDP only lets you have a single IP address per media stream. Now, there have been multiple proposals for additional SDP parameters. There was one called uh, NAT, or ANAT, which is defined in RFC 4091 and 4092, and some people are, are using that out there, which basically set up a, a way that in the SDP, it would say you could supply multiple IP addresses and, and do that. That's been deprecated by the IETF to, for ICE, in the uh, which is RFC 5245, and basically with ICE, your client negotiates between the endpoints, between the user agents, to say which IP addresses can I use, which, uh, which, in, in which way can I go and work with this. And ICE, you know, in most part, has been thought about for using in that traversal, and it uses a combination of stun and turn to go and figure out which IP, IP um, addresses to use, but it basically presents a series of, of pairs of IP addresses, and the, and the clients try to figure out which one to use to go make this communication. Well, it's not only good for firewalls and that, it's also good for IPv4 to V6. And, and, that's a, um, and that's a part of what's using with ICE. I mean, the challenge, I think, with ICE right now is it's not widely deployed in many of the clients and the user agents that people are using. So there are discussions. Some people would like to see if there's a way to have other parameters within SDP. But the way forward from the IETF right now is certainly ICE. And I talked earlier, NAT, NAT will still be with us for reasons I can get into if you really care, but STUN, TURN, ICE, all of those things that are part of IPv4 SIP are also there in IPv6. Uh, again, I mentioned earlier RFC 6157, IPv6 transition to session initiation protocol, um, and you can go and get that right there at that URL, and I'll come back to that uh, on a later scene. Some other considerations about IPv6. You have a lot beyond SIP and the, uh, and the SDP components, too. You've got other interfaces, web management systems, logging APIs. You also might have custom SIP headers. If you're passing a custom SIP header between one endpoint to another and it uses an IP address for some reason, uh, an IPv4 address, will that work when you're in an IPv6 space? Uh, Multi-vendor interop, always a big issue. SPC firewall support, all of those are pieces you need to be thinking about in terms of that. Just last week at the SIPNOC event down in Herndon, Virginia, put on by the SIP Forum, I, I moderated an IPv6 uh, Birds of Feather session, a BOF, and we talked a lot about what these issues are and some of these concerns people have, the challenges with IPv6, and we identified a couple different uh, potential actions. One concern that was raised was there's not a lot of uh, migration plans that are out there. There's, um, you know, there's, there's some people who are looking at it, some ways to do it, but there's not a whole lot out there. And so one of the actions that could potentially be done is to help collect and, and publicize some of those. Um, there are some existing interop tests out there, but uh, there's some questions raised about how well those really depict SIP as it is now and, and how we can provide feedback to the IPv6, IPv6 forum and some other groups that have those. Um, case studies of successful migrations, 
listing some of these tools so people can find things like Linphone or any of the other soft phones that may support IPv6. And also just kind of general education about what IPv6 and SIP is all about. Things like this webinar and others. There is a new mailing list you can join, SIPforum.org, mailman list info IPv6. You can see it right there. Um, go ahead and join that. And uh, you can join that mailing list. And we would expect within the SIP forum to kick off some more discussion around are these potential actions that I listed here, are these things that the SIP forum could take on and help with? Are there other bodies within the industry that could do it, et cetera? What would be the right space for us to work with? Let me just briefly kind of touch a little bit on, on Voxeo's side of things, and then I'll get into some Q&A. Voxeo has a couple of products. One is our Prophecy product, which uh, is downloads and installs a couple of minutes. It's voice XML, CCXML. Um, we added just recently, uh, in March, the support for IPv6, also wideband audio, and some other pieces. People build all sorts of things. Anything you can hook a phone up to, they've built on top of Prophecy, either in our hosted cloud or on a, in a premise environment. Either way, whether it's large-scale IVRs to Facebook applications and you know anything that you can possibly put a phone up to. Now, in the more recent days, more recent years, people have been looking at, well, how do I go beyond voice into IM and SMS, social, and all that? And we've looked at how do we provide one platform to go and connect across all of these different channels. And that's and Voxeo and Voxeo's proxy provides the the media server and the components underneath there that make all this kind of communication happen. So, like I said, we added IPv6 support. You can download a copy right now if you'd like to for Windows, Linux, or Mac OS X. It's, uh, it's there at Voxeo.com Prophecy. Uh, the configuration process on this first release is, uh, does require a little bit of manual editing. You have to go edit a couple configuration files and make a couple changes to it. But uh, we are in the process of changing that, so that an upcoming release in the next little bit here will automate that a bit. But you can find the instructions there on that page as well. If you're familiar with our products, Voxeo Designer, which is a graphical interface for designing apps, that does not currently with IPv6, but again, it's something we're working with too. Um, to show you what it looks like, you know, there's a management screen. Well, let me just go right to a demo. So let me just flip over here, and I'm going to call in. I'm just going to call in here on Linphone and make a call in. Server. This is call XML. For the DTMS test, press 1. You can see I'm taking to a 10-digit number followed by the pound key. You entered 5060. Welcome to the Volkswagen. Yeah, so I mean, okay, I'm making a call into an application server. I mean, I know that's not necessarily um, a brilliant, but I mean, hey, it's there. It's working. You can see up here in the in the uh, website, if you look at this, I'm up here in the Prophecy Commander. If you look at the top of the screen, you can see that I've got a, um, a, a IPv6 address, and I'm communicating in there. I'm looking at my applications. I'm doing all this. This is what Prophecy has and what I can work with. So here's here's that's a quick bit on Prophecy. Let me uh, flip back to the slides. We also have another product called Prism, which is a SIP and XMPP application server and a media server, XIM presence, all of that. It's designed for people really using high demand environments. It can, it can use, uh, do over like 20,000 simultaneous connections on a single call. Very complex call control things, people using it in various different IMS levels. And that's what, Pro what Prism is all about. And, and it's got a full SIP registrar, proxy, all the pieces that are there. And we added IPv6 support, again, actually just recently coming out. And you can download a, a, a free a developer version of that as well, again, for Windows, Linux, or uh, Mac OS X there. So with that, I want to get talking and get in some of the questions. I see a load of good questions in there. So uh, some good stuff I'll take a look at. So um, you can get started again if you go to this link I put up here, bit.ly slash Voxeo IPv6. There's some good links there and some good uh, Tutorials, I'll be adding more as we put more tutorials up there and some more screencasts and pieces are there. I would encourage you to, uh, to look at the SIP forum IPv6 mailing list. Join it. I would encourage you to do that. You'll help uh, the larger community go with that. Also, point your pen attention to World IPv6 Day. It's coming up on June 8th, so just a short bit away here, a month from now. And it is a time, if you go to the Internet Society's website, when a large number of companies, Google, Facebook, Yahoo, Rackspace, a zillion other companies, are joining together to really focus on what would, uh, making their websites in particular um, vi visible over, over IPv6. Right now, you can go to, there are separate sites like ipv6.google.com and, and uh, ipv6. Uh, or v6.facebook.com, things like that. But they're talking about making their main websites accessible over IPv6. And it'll be a good test to see what's going on. But in this next month, I expect we'll see a lot of hype, a lot of push 
a lot of buzz around IPv6. And so it's good to pay attention to that. It's there. Uh, our next jam session that we have coming up after uh, will be June 9th, the day after World IPv6 Day. And so we'll be talking about wideband audio, HD audio as some people call it, and what it can do. And you can find out more about that there. So with that, I am going to turn to some of the questions, and I see a whole bunch coming in here, and let me see what we can look at here. I need to open this window a little bit more, and I see even more questions pouring in. This is great. Okay. Can I describe, uh, okay, let's see. Can I look at this? Is IPv6 even going to be relevant until all of the network providers adopt it? Ha! Great question. But I think th the answer to that is yes and no, because people who have larger backbones, larger enterprise networks, larger things, certainly are looking at that. I know certainly some of the universities, some service providers, other people are doing that. And the, the large network providers are looking at it. We've been in conversations, I mean, part of the reason why we have IPv6 in our products is because some of those service providers are using our products for interconnect on their backbones. If you look at some of the large cable MVNOs who have a, a, a zillion different set-top devices and other pieces and parts that are out there, they're looking at how do they use IPv6 to go and make those kind of connections that are out there. You're also seeing IPv6 being used in interesting overlay networks and other pieces. Um, many of you may have um, have uh, Apple products, and if you do, you may know there's a Back to My Mac product that lets you go and, and connect back to your Mac from another device. That's actually all using IPv6 as a kind of overlay on different types tops of things. So there's some interesting pieces where people are using it. Again, as we move out into more of this Internet of Things, more mobility, we'll have more of that out there. But for it to really get out there, you know, um, we're going to need it to come out in the network uh, in the network providers. I mean, I'm using it for my home office using a tunnel through um, through tunnelbroker.net, and that works great. But it's but it's not at my home. I don't my cable provider up here, who I get my internet access through, does not yet have IPv6. And but I think many of them are looking at how do they go and do that. So what do I think the timeline for them all jump on board with parallel IPv6 networks? Some of that is is will depend on region. If we look at Asia Pacific, where they were left out of the IPv4 address game, uh, they've got a lot of forward thinking work on this, a lot of work on that, and also APNIC the uh, regional internet registrar over there is more depleted on their IPv4 address pool than the other internet registrars are. So some regions of the world are certainly going to get to IPv6 um, piece, you know, sooner than they than they than other parts will. Timeline, I don't know. If I had a crystal ball, uh, everybody would like that because on a certain level, we've been talking about IPv6 coming for years, right? But uh, they will be jumping on board. I, I I have to think some of them, I'm sure, will put up carrier grade NAT and things like that to go. And, uh, and do what they can to prolong that as well. Somebody says, uh, to use IPv6 for my private network on the LIN phone, or using LIN phone, does my internet provider have to support IPv6? Uh, no, because what you can use is you can use a service from, um, well, tunnelbroker.net is one of them. There's a couple others who do let you go and set up uh, IPv6 tunnels over IPv4 um, so that you can set, get your network up online. And I put up, a, again, a couple of blog posts around that um, one is some of the wireless access devices. Um, I use a, an Apple Time Capsule or an Apple Airport Express, but I, some of the other ones as well will very easily let you make it so that you can set up a tunnel from the from the, wi the Wi-Fi access device back to the tunnel broker, and then all the all your Wi-Fi connections can have IPv6 just that simply and easily. So you can do that, and um, you can go to tunnelbroker.net is one service. There's also a site out there called um, Six xxs.net, sixxs.net, which is sixaccess.net is the, the, uh, the terminology behind it. But there's a wiki there. And um, the wiki has a listing of service providers who support IPv6, tunnel brokers. It has a, a listing of, um, of uh, um, service, internet service providers who support it, of VPS, of hosting providers who support it. So a lot of good information you can get from there. And I should add that to the uh, IPv6 resource page. I don't think I have that on there as well. Uh, somebody said, I presume that asterisk I'm trying to register uh, will already have it. Yes, asterisk, um, IP, uh, asterisk version 8 or 1.8 has uh, a good bit of, of IPv6 work in it. Uh, Ole jo Johansson, who some of you may know if you're dealing with asterisk from the asterisk circles, has been doing a lot of work around that, around IPv6 with, uh, with asterisk, with SIP, with things like that. So um, you, c you can find that out there. And, and He's actually got a website up and a, and a Facebook page around SIP 
and IPv6, and there are some links around there from around Asterisk as well. I actually have links to his sites on that IPv6 uh, resource page that I, that I show there. Okay, another question. Um, how, do, how do IPv4 and IPv6 networks communicate, and what if one network is IPv4 and another is IPv6? And the answer is to that is that you do have to have something in between that will be talking to them, and that's where you get into these dual stack uh, devices, dual stack routers, dual stack uh, uh, um, servers, other pieces. So, you know, in, in like in proxies, in our case, you know, Boxio Proxy is a dual stack device, so you can connect to it on IPv4 and IPv6. And I showed you calling into it on a um, on an IPv6 on Lin phone using IPv6. I could have also called into it on an IPv4. Um, soft phone, and it would have connected into the box. And in fact, if I would, if they were both calling into a conferencing app, Proxy would have bridged them together into the the conferencing app, and it would have all worked that way because Prophecy has the V4 and the V6 stacks, and it's communicating out below that or out to that because all the SIP stuff, all the RTP stuff, is ultimately happening at a higher level above the the network transport layer where this is going on. And that's the same for other SIP servers and SIP devices. They to bridge between those, they would have to be uh, a dual stack. There'd have to be a dual stack device in there. And it seems like we're using dual stack for a very long time. You got it. Dual stack is here for, a, for an awfully long time, which is why we have to think about these scenarios. We have to go and, and do that. Um, so the, uh, somebody asked here a question around how to make use of an assigned slash 48 if I have a deployment of two local sites with multiple VLANs and all of that. and and, and um, so I, I can't answer that question here in, in this, but I can certainly respond back in the email. But to what the person's saying here, I talked before about how address blocks, subnet blocks, are typically given out on a slash 64. That's typically for one subnet, because if you do the auto configuration, your MAC address is taking up the lower 64 bits and the upper 64 bits are the network host or network portion. But uh, very commonly now, ISPs will give out a slash 48 for the network portion, which means that, so then you can have multiple subnets. So the bits between 49 and 64, the, that block of bits right there, that's 16 bits, would give you the, um, that would be the part where you can set up multiple subnets. So you would use that portion of the, of the network address to allocate, to, to define your various different subnets. So if you have multiple subnets, you can go and do it that way. But uh, I will try, the person that answers, I will try to answer it back to you in uh, in email form. So uh, you, somebody asked about when our cloud center, our, our infrastructure will be IPv6, and we're working on that. So I don't have a time frame to give you, but uh, we certainly are looking at how do we provide that in the hosted side. One of the things we know about Boxeo is we are definitely focused on giving the same experience on the premise and also in the hosted cloud and all of that. Um, if you looked at our hosted white paper, which is available up on our, our, um, our site, you know that we have a substantial infrastructure and we have put a lot into our our cloud infrastructure. We run our own cloud. We're not using uh, Amazon's cloud, as people were talking about recently. The uh, the space out there, Amazon, with its challenges. We run our own cloud infrastructure, our own network of data centers, and we have redundant failovers. And uh, you know, we we do not have single points of failure in that. So there's a lot of work involved with doing something like that and making it all work over IPv6. So we're it's certainly something on our radar and on our horizon, but I don't have a time frame quite right on that. Another question. Um, Oh, <laughs> somebody asked on Twitter, they can't watch this on Android or Linux. Well, I'm sorry about that. The service that we use, GoToWebinar from Citrix, is, um, is uh, I think it only works on Windows and Mac OS X. So I'd love to get a nice cross-platform uh, webinar provider. I'm certainly always looking at new ones and pieces that are out there. So uh, if the Linux or Android person wants to drop me a note, I'd be glad to, uh, to chat with them and figure out uh, what services might work with some of what they're doing out there. Got a good question. Uh, somebody says, if running Linux, you may use the Miredo package, M-I-R-E-D-O package, which will give you IPv6 in one minute. Yes, I imagine, I don't know what that is. I imagine that's using Pareto tunnels, which are another technique for getting tunnels up and running. And that is a way that you can go and, and do that. Um, what else here? I've got another question on uh, carrier grade NAT will, pro will break, probably break SIP. No? Doing this would require these providers to run SBCs or ALGs. I don't see them caring. I bet they'll just do it to make you sign up for a premium service, unless you keep your public IP. Well, that could be. Um, I think we're going to see a lot of gains as, as IPv4 addresses get going on there. But yes, to the question, I mean, just adding another layer of NAT inside there 
if you move from a from a NAT up at the edge of your network that goes out to a public network where you run your own AL application layer gateway or your own SBC, um, you know, adding another layer of NAT in there so that you're going out to um, to a public, uh, you know, you're double NATing it in there, et cetera. That just does add one more layer of complexity to a SIP environment, and and would, in, in some level, require that that at the uh, at the outside layer, the edge of the carrier grade NAT, there would have to be something that would let you go and, and be able to, you know, make that transition across there. The largest issue with SIP, of course, is that it, it uses your IP addresses in various different headers and pieces that uh, that, uh, that well, it break when you go across NAT. So it's uh, it was not NAT friendly from the get go. Um, any other questions? Let's see, um, I've still got a couple more, and feel free to raise more questions that are on there. Uh, somebody asked me about what I'm using to host um, Prophecy. What out there? I'm using a, a, a VPS, a virtual private server. It uh, comes from a company, uh, one of the various different companies. The particular one I'm using is ARP Networks, but I've, I'm running it on. I've got several VPSs out there running on several different hosting providers. I went to what I talked about earlier. That's six x x f. S I X X S dot net six X six access is what they, they they call it, but six X whatever it is that that site I went there and I found a list of hosting providers and then I went around and looked at who would give me the best deal for a virtual private server that provided the the RAM I needed the disk space etc to go and use and I'm paying about thirty bucks a month to have this site out there but it provides me with an IPv6 test bed so that I've got in my case I've got proxy running up there in a VPS and then I'm able to access it through um, through the tunnel that I've got coming to my home office so I can be able to use IPv6 here on my home office with clients like Linphone um, or the um, the other one. Somebody else asked do I know of other clients that work with it? I, there's another soft client called uh, Jitsi, J-I-T-S-I, Jitsi.org is the site. It used to be called SIP Communicator but they changed the name as the soft phone evolved uh, to be more than to be more than uh, just uh, just SIP, and it supports IPv6, but um, but the challenge that it has is that it needs to register to to make SIP calls. At least when I was using it, you had to use a SIP. Um, you had to register with a SIP uh, proxy with a SIP registrar with with an IPvPX basically in order to make calls. And in the particular way I do it, I'm using it with um, with proxy. Proxy does not have um, out of the box, does not have a registrar and, uh, and proxy, and it's just used as an application server. It, sets in, it fits into that environment and typically is deployed, you know, in conjunction with a IP PBX or other uh, SIP server in some form. So you would use it to provide your applications, and people are using it with, you know, any of the typical IP PBXs from the mainline vendors, open source device systems like Asterisk, FreeSwitch, other pieces like that. And so proxy runs adjacent to it, and so it's designed to work as an application server. So I need to make direct SIP. PC to PC calls, and that's what I like about Linphone. No registration required. I can just go and just fire it off and do it. With uh, with Jitsi, I need to go and do a registrar, and I'm just personally not running an IPPBX that supports IPv6. Now, if Ali were here on the call, he'd tell me I need to get Astros running somewhere and register with it, and, and yeah, I probably do, but I don't right now. So um, that's that's uh, there. There may be some other, excuse me, maybe some other uh, SIP uh, soft phones out there. I'd love to hear about them. So if you know about them, you can go and do it. I have, um, oh, cool. So somebody says here, my provider has already assigned some IPv6 addresses for me to use. Man, I want your internet connection. Because um, I, I can't get that yet. And this person's coming from Europe. Well, hey, kudos to you. That's awesome. He says, I have a switch between the cable and my machines. That piece of equipment needs to support IPv6, doesn't it? Yes. So in order to do that, the device on the edge of your network would, um, excuse me, the device on the edge of your network would need to support um, would need to support IPv6. So in order to connect to that IPv6 address given to you by your provider, it would have to support that. So whatever your device is on the edge of the network, um, you would need to support that. So whatever it is, your gateways, um, firewall, whatever it may be, that would need to do that. Uh, another question: Oh, can you describe debugging tools for RTP through six to four or hurricane tunnels? Uh, no. <laughs> right off the bat, I can't. But uh, I do have some, and that was actually one of the points that was raised at the uh, SIP, uh, the SIP knock boff last week was that there are um, there aren't necessarily the full range of debugging tools that we'd love to see. Now there is Wireshark, okay, and Wireshark has great IPv6 support, 
and so you can certainly use it to monitor the interface and see the ITP streams going down the, uh, the 64 or Hurricane Tunnel. So you, you can use Wireshark as a great tool that's out there. And, uh, but that was one of the points that was identified was that um, debugging gets more complex and it would be good if there were some more tools identified out there. And in fact, I think there was a debugging vendor that was there that was talking about it. Somebody asks about uh, um, Bria, they say. Well, I'm assuming they're talking about Counterpass Bria and whether or not, I don't know whether it supports IPv6. Uh, I know the Counterpath folks are, are pretty uh, slick on working on stuff and they, they do great work. And so if it doesn't already support it, I would imagine it probably will at some point soon. I uh, just haven't seen that. Somebody else, uh, oh, the guy in Europe is giving me his uh, internet service provider in Portugal. I'm uh, a couple thousand miles away from you and there's a big ocean in there, but uh, that's cool. If I were living in Portugal, it sounds like a good provider to be checking out. And somebody else mentions Comcast as support for IPv6. Yes, Comcast has been a major driver of IPv6 here in North America, and they've been doing some trials out for residential users. They've been doing a lot of things. Um, there's a lot of Comcast around where I, where I am up here in uh, New Hampshire is where I live up near Boston, but my particular city has a contract with another uh, cable com company, and so I'm not in that. But uh, Comcast, if you are a, if you have Comcast as your provider, you can, uh, if you look around for residential IPv6 trials, they have a place where you can go and, and sign up. I don't know if it's still open, but for a while you can go and sign up and uh, request to be part of their beta program and, and go from there. Any other questions? Um, somebody says, uh, um, not to switch, it's layer two. Oh, yes, sure, right. Okay, so to be, uh, to be crystal clear, the, uh, the router on the edge of the network needs to be, needs to support IPv6. So the person who wrote in from Portugal who has that, that connection, your, your switch, your Ethernet switch that's, that's there, it's layer two. It doesn't need IPv6 support because it's below that. It's Ethernet layer. The, the, the traffic's just flowing through there. But the router, the gateway, the firewall, whatever's at the edge of your network that's communicating there, that's taking the, the IPv6, uh, the, the traffic from your ISP, and bringing that into your home network, that device, whatever it is, um, needs to needs to support IPv6. Somebody else writes, "I just got a uh, Belkin router and does six to four. Pretty okay. So yeah, again, the, so he's got a Belkin router which does the same thing that my Apple router does, which is that it automatically sets up um, the six to four, the translation to go from um, IPv6 to v4, unless you basically run tunnel tunnel IPv6 there as well. So um, so that's pretty cool too. I'm I'm sure there will be other uh, devices like that that will continue to come out and do it. Um, let's see. Any other questions that we have? I've got uh, one more about explain the SDP issue again. And well, okay. So going back to that slide, the issue is that you can't um, you can't in a standard session description pro protocol part of the SIP packet, the SDP packet, a standard one, you can't put both an IPv4 and an IPv6 address. You have to put one or the other in a standard packet. And the idea being of how this would work is that with ICE, you would first use ICE to go and find which addresses you should communicate with, and that part of things would bring about the, the IP address, whether it's v4 or v6, it would be part of the SDP negotiation that would be there. So, um, whoa, a whole bunch of more stuff coming in here. <laughs> okay, so, uh, yep. I, Somebody says they have to connect with some ed, ed, to see if they're going to support IPv6. Uh, what's the status of IPv6 security? Oh, okay, with uh, public IP and IPsec. So one of the questions that uh, that you get into with IPv6, or one of the things people say is, well, it must be more secure because it has IPsec as part of it, right? Well, the answer is that that IPsec is mandated to be in an IPv6 stack. So any implementation of IPv6 has to include IPsec as part of it. But that doesn't mean it has to be turned on. It just means that IPsec has to be there. So uh, you can have IPv6 connections and all that, but you don't necessarily mean that you're going to use IPsec. So on that regard, it's, it's just it's, it's, IPv6 says it's got to have IPsec to be part of it. And, uh, and, and there you go. Now, the general status of IPv6 security is uh, is that IPv6 has really all the same security issues you have in IPv4, but different tools, different things, different stuff like that. For instance, on a Linux box, 
uh, you would typically use IP tables on if you're using Red Hat, Linux, CentOS, whatever, something that flavor. You would use um, you would use uh, IP tables to create your firewall rules ultimately for your your IPv4 address, your IPv4 interface. Well, IPv for IPv6 you use IPv6 tables, so it's a different tool. It's a fork of the tool. Well, not a fork. It's a different tool. It's IPv6 tables versus IP tables. And so you have different tools instead of ping, you have ping six. And, and, and some tools, some tool vendors are doing it that way. Others of them have a tool that will you know, so work across both stacks. So you have issues like that that from a security point of view you have to think about. The other, the other piece is that um, you have to think about uh, issues that if you're using these tunnels, like the current solution like tunnel brokers or other six to four mechanisms, you are putting your home network, you know, in my particular case, you're putting it live on the public IPv6 network. So the question comes up, in that Wi-Fi device, in that router device, or whatever you may have, you know, what kind of security is on there? So if you're not just making it so that somebody can go and uh, try to enumerate your devices and try to get into your devices and, and try to crack them. Now, granted, IPv6 address space is much larger, and so the enumeration process to by enumeration, I mean scanning down IP addresses is going to take a lot longer, but still, somebody could go and find it. So it, that is a concern, I think, as people go and deploy more IPv6 and more pieces like that. I, I think also one of the concerns in IPv6 in general is that there's a lot of IPv6 that's enabled by default. Um, you know, like Mac OS X, Windows, other things will come up with IPv6 enabled by default. And so people will have an IPv6 address, and they may not even know they have it. And if somebody goes and, and sets up IP, IPv6 tunnel and starts to do router advertisements, you know, every device in your network could suddenly get an IPv6 address for your tunnel and could be publicly accessible and all those things. So there's some security things to think about there. There was a, a, a recent discussion uh, that just went out yesterday. It was a big hoo-ha on the IPv6 side of things around uh, articles about Microsoft and Juniper were being warned about this, this, uh, this issue that had come out. Actually, it's been about a year now. But it has to do with a rogue router you know, flooding a network with router advertisements and basically causing a denial of service that would cause the system to shut down. And, and, and there's different techniques that have been approved and implemented by others to go and deal with this to basically only accept router advertisements from authenticated sites and so on. A couple different scenarios that are there. But those type of security issues are, are still you know, things that need to be tested. One of the concerns, I think, with IPv6 is that it hasn't been tested. The security community in general, the IPv6 community, doesn't have um, a huge amount of knowledge. That you know, like to, as we said here, there's not a lot of IPv6 available to the consumers, to the public outside of tunnels, and many people haven't set those up because in some cases they don't know how easy it is. But but they haven't set it up, so the security community needs to go and understand more about that, and and the uh, the security defense community, meaning the the folks who are protecting against attackers. The attackers, I'm sure, are out there already looking at it, saying, hey, how can we go and break this? What else can we do with this kind of stuff? So, um, so anyway, that's a, the concern on there. On the, on the security side, on the SIP side in particular, I mean, many of the things that we do in IPv4 SIP for security with uh, secure RTP, with, with, um, with TLS encrypted SIP, those things work at a higher level than the IP level, so they pretty much work the same way, uh, whether it's IPv6 or IPv4. So that was probably a long one. Those of you who know me know that I love uh, uh, security, so get me going on that, and I'll be a while. But uh, got a couple people saying thanks and, uh, and all that and um, all that. So I think we are going to wrap this up. It's been a great webinar. Thank you for all these great questions. Again, you can go to our IPv6 resource page at bit.ly slash voxeoipv6, and uh, you can also follow our blog at speakingofstandards.com uh, or speakingofstandards at blogs.voxeo.com so I speak of standards. And I put on the, this page that you're seeing the tag IPv6. That's for the IPv6 stories. The blog itself has a, a variety of uh, different uh, stories related to standards. You can, of course, follow us on Twitter and the pieces like that. And again, if you want to check our next uh, webinar, you are uh, welcome to do that. Again, that will be on June um, 9th related to, uh, to HD voice and, and wideband audio. So thank you again. You can uh, find this and other art at uh, blogs.boxeo.com slash jam sessions. And uh, thank you for attending. And good luck with IPv6. Let's uh, see where it all goes. Thank Bye for you. now. Bye.